Well, the White House remains confident that the debt ceiling bill will pass today. Joining us now to discuss the bill prospects and impact on Americans and the economy is Bharat Ramamurthy, uh, de Deputy Director for the National Economic Council at the White House. Uh, Bharat, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, now, you have heard the thank comments you. of House members on both sides of the aisle. Uh, there are Republicans who don't like the deal. There are folks in the, in the Democratic Party who don't like the deal. At this hour, we know anything can happen, but how confident are you that this will get through Congress and we will not go off that proverbial cliff? Well, we, we think this is a good, fair deal that has something for everyone to like in it. Uh, we think that it does three important things. Number one, it takes the possibility of a default off the table, which is critically important for the economy. Number two, it, it protects Social Security, protects Medicare, protects Medicaid. Those are important priorities for the president. Uh, and number three, it really uh, protects the economic progress that we've made over the last two years, where we've seen the unemployment rate come down to the lowest it's been since 1969 and over 12 million new jobs uh, created. So uh, we think it's a good deal. We think ultimately this will get through the House and through the Senate and get to the president's desk uh, in advance of that June 5th deadline. So how is the White House working with Republicans on the debt ceiling issue and what is the NEC doing to prevent this from happening again? We talk about this all the time, you know, we come to this point and, and, and it kind of, ha something happens in the 11th hour ultimately, but we do have to have these conversations every single time the debt ceiling comes up. Um, so what, what exactly is being done to prevent this from happening? Well, I think ultimately what you had here was a good, uh, good faith negotiation between uh, the president and the speaker involving congressional leadership on both the Democratic and Republican side. Uh, it reflects the reality of the divided government situation that we have. The House is controlled by Republicans. Uh, whenever that happens, you end up having to have a good uh, negotiation about what uh, tax and spending policy is going to be uh, for the next year or two, and that's exactly what you see here. Uh, one of the good things about this deal is that it uh, pushes the debt limit uh, past uh, 2025. Uh, that means it, redu it removes that uncertainty over the economy, at least for uh, about a couple of years. That's a good thing. Uh, as you note, uh, ideally we wouldn't have this kind of brinksmanship at all because it does uh, uh, cause uh, harm to the economy, even just the possibility of a default. Uh, and so that's something we have to look at next time around. But I think in the short term, uh, one of the real benefits of this deal is that it's not just a short term uh, uh, address of the debt ceiling. It, it at least addresses it for uh, over a year. Which is still not a long time, right. to be fair. And whoever wins the next election, this is going to be item number one on that agenda. So your presidency, whoever it is after 24, is going to walk into office and have to deal with this all over again, depending on the state of our politics then. And it's going to be here just like that. So it, it does feel uh, short like term. Tomorrow. And particularly because <laughs> the debt ceiling is not something that has to exist. It's not in the Constitution. We, Washington chooses on its own to operate this way. Big picture, do you think it sets any kind of negative precedent that uh, the, the White House did negotiate on this issue after saying it would not, that now this debt ceiling becomes another negotiable, transactional, on-the-table issue in, in D.C., like Joe Manchin is going to get his, his pipeline in West Virginia, which has nothing to do with America's ability to pay back its credit card. Has the White House set a bad precedent? No, I don't believe so. I mean, look, at the, at the end of the day, uh, from the very first meeting that uh, the president had with the speaker, uh, with the other congressional leadership, there was broad agreement among everyone in that room that default uh, was not uh, an acceptable outcome. And so I think what you ultimately had here was a fairly standard uh, negotiation uh, in a divided government situation about the budget. You know, this happened uh, previously uh, in 2018 and 2019 when you had a democratically controlled House and a Republican president. It happened in the Obama administration. The deal you see uh, before the House today in my mind is a fairly typical uh, divided government budget deal where not everybody gets everything that they want, where there's something in there for Democrats and something in there for Republicans. And so, again, it, ideally we would not have this kind of brinksmanship. It's important to note that uh, Democrats in 2018 and 2019, when they controlled the House and there's a Republican president, they didn't engage in this kind of brinksmanship. But that aside, I think what you have at the end of the day is a good, fair deal that I'm not sure sets a negative precedent going forward. Aside from any, you know, frustrations that Democrats or Republicans may have, what have been, you know, some of your conversations with senators as far as, you know, any amendments or tweaks? I mean, at this point, it's probably too late for all of that. Um, but what, what what have you been hearing? Look, both uh, the Speaker and, and Majority Leader Schumer are going to run uh, the legislative process in their respective houses. We defer to them. 
uh, on all of that. You know, whether there's going to be amendment votes or not, I'm not sure I, I, I would refer you to them. Uh, ultimately, this is the deal that the president and the speaker reached. Uh, we think it's a fair deal that protects the interests of both Democrats uh, and Republicans. Uh, we don't expect there to be unanimous support. It's very hard for anything in, in this world to get unanimous support. But we think ultimately the votes are going to be there in both the House and the Senate to get this to the president's desk. And I think once we put this behind us, uh, we can get back to the good work of building and growing on the economic progress that the president has made over the last two years. I just want to uh, emphasize again, nearly 13 million jobs created in the first two years. That's more in two years than any president has had uh, in four years. So we really have a lot of underlying strength in the economy. Uh, and it's time to build on that over the next two years. And real quick, our, our prior guest right before you made a very cogent point and a realistic point that any grand deal ultimately would include spending cuts, but also include uh, ways to raise revenue as well, closing loopholes, higher taxes. Do you agree with just the general idea, without details, that the answer is somewhere in, in the middle here in terms of Democrat, <laughs> Democrats agreeing to some cuts, Republicans agreeing to some revenue raising measures, and we would get perhaps to a longer lasting, fairer, broader, grander deal than the one before us now? Well, I think it, it, the details of that uh, depend quite a lot. So uh, the, the president's budget, for example, uh, reduces the deficit by $3 trillion over the next 10 years. And yes, it does it by uh, cutting wasteful spending. In our mind, what, what wasteful spending is, is the hundreds of billions of dollars that we spend on prescription drugs when the Americans are spending two or three times what uh, other folks are in other countries on the exact same prescription drug. Uh, we're cutting wasteful spending on oil and gas subsidies for an industry that made $200 billion last year. We don't think that that's necessary. So yeah, we can cut some wasteful spending in that way. And there are some uh, taxes that we can impose on the very wealthy and, and big corporations. For example, the president has proposed uh, a billionaire mi minimum tax to make sure that literally the thousand billionaires in the United States aren't paying lower tax rates than your typical nurse or teacher. So yeah, we've, we've proposed a balanced approach. We would love to work with Republicans uh, on that approach. What we don't think is appropriate is the uh, extreme across the board uh, dramatic cuts to government programs that the Republicans proposed in their original deal. And thankfully, this final deal does not include that. And if you could pick one word to describe the working relationship between Biden and McCarthy coming out of this process, what would that word or phrase be, sir? Then we'll let you go. Uh, respectful. I think ultimately you have uh, a president and a speaker who understand what's at stake for the country and were able to get to a deal that uh, protected both of their interests. And again, uh, we're confident that that's going to be enough to get it through the House and the Senate. All right, Bharat Ramamurti, thank you so much for joining us.